What's happening in San Diego? It is opening day. Let's go Padres. We are just three hours and change away from getting things rolling down at Petco Park. Annie and Elston rolling with you live from Baja Ricks, just outside the ballpark with Annie Heilbrunn. Braden Soprenic getting all plugged in. Craig Elston on hand with you with a ton of great Padres fans, many of whom have been out here since before 6 a.m. Annie rolling through the Ben and Woods live appearance. And now here we go, two-hour show, the pre-pre-game show to get things locked and loaded before Sammy Levitt steps in. Eco Water SoCal pregame show at 1210. And then here we go. Padres baseball downtown. This is great. I think this is a great crowd. Lots of Padres jerseys, lots of familiar faces that I see, lots of wonderful people. So I'm loving it. It's, you can tell it's so vibrant downtown right now. You have all the fans walking around, streaming into Petco Park. I just stopped by the clubhouse, had a little chat with Joe Musgrove. It's great. Jeez, really? Yeah. Wow. Andy already doing work. All right. So t take us inside. What's going on in there? Well, a lot of media there. Opening Already. day brings a lot of media, yeah. and then by tomorrow, it's a lot less. Um, but Joe has on his San Diego State jersey. He's super excited for the game later on today. He hopes that uh, they can shoot threes like they did the other day. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and I thought he had something great to say about Mike Schilt. You know, he was asked about Mike Schilt and what's different this year versus last year. And he said, you know what? You can. Mike Schilt wants you to walk into his office and let you know let him know if something isn't working. If there's something going on in the clubhouse. And it's, Joe said, look, it's not like we're going to be able to run this team and we're not going to be able to direct what happens. But he wants there to be a lot of accountability. And I thought that was a, a really cool little thing that he said. And we've heard it a little bit, but he just kind of doubled down on it today. That's awesome. So we're here for two hours. This is going to be a pretty free-flowing conversation. I know you and I, you know, chatting last night kind of want to just hit reset it and let's go on the 2024 season what do we like what are we looking for we start with the news of the morning of course which is the setting of the 26-man roster and i did think there were some very interesting decisions that were made in there uh, we'll start with the one i think we've kind of hashed out the most which is pedro avila made this team which means Adrian Morahone didn't make the team. He did have one option remaining. That's one thing that I know has been kind of out there. Did they have an option left? Did they not? They did. He was officially optioned to AAA El Paso, along with Jeremiah Estrada and Randy Vasquez, who we had talked about on yesterday's show. But because Avila makes the team, Morahone doesn't make the team, that means that the Rule 5 kid, right-handed reliever Stephen Kolick, did make the team and he made the bullpen and that's a really really interesting decision to me Annie. obviously he pitched pretty well over the course of spring training but we're not in the mode right now of prospect hoarding right we're not in the mode of coddling a player through a 20 inning bullpen slot just to keep his rights as a rule five that's what <laughs> when ben and i started in like 2000 that's what they were doing with Corey dehan and shane victorino and guys like that uh I don't think the Padres are doing that with Stephen Cole, which means they think he can help this team. Yeah, some surprises on there for sure, but I don't know. It's going to be so fluid, I still feel like. It's going to be really fluid in terms of how they end up working this. You never know, too, what's going on with the guy in terms of um, how his arm might be feeling, anything that they're going through behind the scenes. So, yeah, I mean, definitely a few surprises on there but i think that it's going to be pretty fluid in terms of how they end up using these guys and i don't think they're going to be afraid to move on from certain guys when needed or if they need to kind of put him back in the minors pedro avila of course they can't but um certainly i think that they are thinking they're going to get pedro avila that they've had la last year and that has been doing pretty well in the big league setting and then maybe if they see that slip they move on to the next guy so the next one that I'd say as we move on to the next guy on our conversation as well is Graham Pauly. Graham Pauly makes right. the team. He makes the American opening day roster. And on one side, it's really exciting for the young man because he's going to be out there under the bunting, under the flyover, 42,000 San Diegans going crazy. He'll hear his name cheered for the first time for real at Petco Park. I'm down for all of that for the experience for Graham Pauly. However, experience and Graham Pauly are two words rarely used in the same sentence. He's barely played above high A baseball. And if he's going to be on the bench 
for this team. He's not going to play very much at the big league level either. It's uh, I, I kind of asked around on this one, and apparently while Manny is recovering and getting better and not playing third base all the time or yet, um, it, he, they want to use him. They want to use him, and then probably I'm guessing he'll get sent back down to the minors and get still 130 games there, 110, you know, whatever he needs this season to continue to grow as a player. But the time that they're going to get from him this year, I think they consider to be very valuable at the big league level. And perhaps if he does get off to a hot start, they keep him a little bit longer. But it was surprising. So so they went with two catchers. So Brett Sullivan not on this list. Um, they've got Luis Campisano and Kyle Higashioka. So, yeah, I, I thought that Graham Pauly might be uh, sent down and maybe they would have went with Sully, but it looks like they've gone with Graham Pauly. And we'll see. I, I think I, I think that they might be willing to let him ride for a little bit right now. Well, either way, this is our team now, and here we go into the Giants. As we joked slash half not joked yesterday, playoffs begin today. I mean, this is going to be arguably the best division in Major League Baseball at least one through four, the best division in Major League Baseball. And so every one of these games that you play against the Giants, the Diamondbacks, these are the games that feel like double. They feel like two-game swings, every single one of them, because at the end of the year, if everything sorts the way that literally the whole baseball world believes, the Dodgers will be on top of this division, the Rockies will be on the bottom, Two, three, four is going to be where potentially two playoff teams come out, but probably not three. Yeah, Joe Musgrove was talking about that a little bit too just now, how great this division is. He said he thinks it's the best division in baseball. I have a feeling that most of the other players in that clubhouse feel the same way. And there's there's no doubt that they see that too. It's going to be competitive. You're not going to be able to say that two or three games aren't going to matter. They are probably all very much going to matter, and it's probably going to – if it goes the way it looks on paper, it's going to end up coming down to those you know, final few games. It's going to be very thin margins for this whole division. It will. I, I said it with Ben and Woods just a few minutes ago, but I'll, I'll reiterate it for our crowd. Like, you look at us, the Diamondbacks, the Giants, the Cubs, the Cardinals, the Phillies, the Marlins, the Reds. All of these teams could finish within four games of one another at the end of the year. If you want to put Philly to a slightly higher strata, you could, and you could tuck the Marlins into that group. Like there's probably six, seven teams that are going to finish within three or four games of one another. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a race to that wild card. Now, of course, this is baseball. Everything that looks a certain way on paper by, by the all-star break could be completely ripped to shreds. And we don't know what kind of injuries there's going to be. We don't know what kind of just down years or up years certain players are going to have, but it looks to be very competitive. And I think for that matter, like it looks to be fun. You know, you're not going to have any player that's going to feel like, Hey, I can take a break today or I can just sit this one out. Like you're going to have players who are also for their own ego and their own, you know, wanting to be that guy on the field. They're going to rise. I think to that challenge, not just on the Padres, but all around. I think what we might end up seeing is just some really good competitive baseball. Well, uh, we're going to be seeing it all summer long and we're going to be talking about it all spring and summer long right here on Annie and Elston, but we're going to have a lot of fun between now and 12.05. When we will bow out, we'll turn things over to Sam Levitt inside the Western Metals building, and then we will head our way inside. We will get in there, and I just got to tell you, Annie, I, I can't wait. I can't wait. You know, I, hopefully the audience appreciates over the course of the season and the course of, of time how we come at the sport of baseball like, I love this sport more than any other sport in the world, and I love it as a fan. I love to be in there con la gente, con todos, all of us together. Like, that's what Padres baseball means to me. And, and the way that over the course of the last five years, from the signing of Manny Machado, the extension of Tatis, all the way through to every move that's come to Dylan Cease today, this team is built to win. It's built to excite. And this city was hungry for something to excite them. They were hungry for, for a team to care about them. I'll never forget what this town felt like in 2017, in 2018, after that other team went up the highway 
to Los Angeles. And everyone said, what are we going to do? And the Padres filled that void. They filled that void by spending money, by getting stars. They have electrified this city, this community, this county to get behind Padres baseball. We got our own colors. Now we are brown and gold, you know, like this is us. It used to be you'd look out and you'd see some blue, some white. You're like, are these Dodgers fans? Are they Brewers fans? What's going on? We have our own identity. We have our own community. We have our own passion. And I have to say, once again, thank you to Peter Seidler in memoriam for helping pave the way for this to be what it is today. Yeah, absolutely. And I would push back, not push back. I would add to that also, thank you. To, you know, Ron Fowler was a huge part of that. The whole ownership group. I mean, it was really this ownership ownership group's money that went into doing this. And um, a lot of, there's there's several of them at the top there that have really made contributions to make this all work. And I think that they saw a vision, they believed in it. They wanted to let San Diego have a championship, a winner, some, something that they could be proud of. And they've worked for that. I mean, this is a city that's electrified now by the Padres. And I, I think if you would have asked someone 20 years ago, they would have said, that's never gonna be possible. Not with the right. Chargers, not even after the Chargers left. You still, the year or two after the Chargers left, it still was hard to get anyone really all that excited about the Padres. But they had a vision. They saw the vision through. And I think that more than anything, they gave this city a team that they can be proud of and a park, a ballpark they can be proud of. And it's certainly showing up today. And I think that once everyone gets inside, I mean, it's so fun. You feel all that energy. It's going to be a blast today. It's going to be amazing. We're here to talk about it all with you on Annie and Elston, your two-hour pre pre-game show for a season that will be i hope one to remember let's take our first break when we come back let's talk about the biggest things that's changed between last year and this year maybe the things we're most excited about for 2024 we do that on the other side of this quick timeout. we are live at baja ricks if you don't know where we are it's right where the trolley stop lets off it's right behind home plate on the ballpark like literally if you walk around past where the players garage entrance is you're walking right to us we're right there ensconced in the corner right next to the omni right across the street from the convention center come on by we'll be here at baja rex all day long our show is on till 1205 it's annie and elston underway on san diego's number one sports station 97 through the fan
with you live. Welcome back. We are at Baja Ricks. It is 1018. We are heading our way toward Padres baseball today. Live on the fan, Jesse and Tony coming your way at 110 for the Padres and the San Francisco Giants. It is opening day American style. As we've already got a one and one record. Okay. And thank God for that. Right, Annie? I mean, <laughs> I, <that's good. laughs> I, I've at least had a couple of moments uh, the last two days where I thought, what if, what if, what if on that second game when the big lead was dwindling away? But no, that 15-11 lead means we've, we're carrying momentum into today. Yeah, it's funny, too. Everybody's walking around saying, happy opening day. And then someone will correct. Someone will come along and be like, well, it's actually the home opener. And it's like, no, it feels like opening day. It's okay, opening day. it's opening day. And we get to say that all day long here in San Diego. And um, yeah, getting being able to take in that 1-1 split and also the fact that they know that other game was winnable. They were not blown out of the water on game one in Korea. So I think all of that combined sets them up pretty well to be facing a Giants team that's also starting to put themselves together. I mean, not a whole lot of continuity necessarily um, on this Giants team. They've got some new faces as well and a new manager. So both teams kind of look like looking to find their identity and build something now. Well, it'll be the Padres' old manager across the dugout way, uh, taking a look back at the Padres' new manager, who used to be uh, a member of at least his front office staff, in Mike Schilt. And when we talk about things that we're most excited about for 2024, Annie, I, I would just start and say that Mike Schilt is at the top of that list for me. I did not expect that to be the case. I really, it wasn't something that I was like, oh my God, I'm a Mike Schilt stan. I celebrate his entire catalog from St. Louis. I, he came along and he has won me over on a number of levels. The way he personally attacks the job, his attention to detail, his attention to everybody, like the, the fact that he is a people person at the ultimate level, but also the fact that he, he is a, a manager who's attacking. And I think that the Padres were lacking an attacking attitude last season and they are going to have it this year under Mike Schilt. Right. He definitely wants to go out there and be the aggressor. He doesn't want a team that is not going to back each other. That's not going to stand up for each other. He is someone who is very personable, very friendly, but he has got a mean competitive side. And I mean that in a, in a great way. Um, this guy wants to win and not that Bob Melvin didn't. He certainly did. But Mike Schilt is going to be someone who's a little bit more seen among these players, I, I guess you could say, and there's no right way to do it. Every manager is different. It doesn't mean that Bob Melvin or anyone before him did it, uh, you know, the wrong way. It just means that he is someone who is is going to try to keep these players, hold them accountable, get the superstars to make sure even they are accountable, which can be very difficult to do for any manager, especially when there's quite a few of them. But right now they've all bought in, and I think that's what you need. Yeah, I mean, the Padres went 12 for 26 with runners in scoring position in Japan, in Korea. I'm not expecting them to obviously hit 500 with score, or 440 or something with runners in scoring position all year. But I did think that every time the team got into an offensive situation, they approached it with the intent of getting the runner around and in, as opposed to waiting for the big fly, the big inning, the, the six run bomb. That's a stylistic change that the Padres really needed to make last year. Situational hitting, you mean, in yeah. terms of, yeah, yeah. I think that a lot of them were pressing last year. I think a lot of them were trying to be the guy. Uh, there was a lot of new faces, a lot of new superstars in there. And I think that each one of them sort of wanted to be that hero, wanted to take that the reins there. And when you're all struggling collectively, no one gets to be that person. It's really hard to establish. Um, and so I think, look, this year they, they, uh, they're more comfortable. Xander Bogarts has this is year two for him. Um, I think that you're going to see guys take the reins more. And it's all really, though, it, it matters how you play on the field. So for a lot of them, go out there, show up, post up, get out there, play good baseball, and you're going to establish those kinds of leaders in the clubhouse. What are you most excited for for 2024? I think I'm just excited for the intrigue. You know, this is a team that looks like it could go either way. I mean, in the division, certainly, because the division is so good. But when you have had the struggles that they've had, over the last year and then two years ago, and you've seen these kinds of, you know, breakdowns at times, I'm looking forward to seeing how they fight back, how they claw back, how they establish themselves as a team that is not going to bend when the going gets tough. And I think that they're absolutely going to do that. I think they learned a lot from last year. And so I personally am excited to see kind of the, the fight from them. 
Yeah. Uh, it, is it there? How is it there? How does it continue as the season goes on? How do they attack these divisional games? You know, we talked about it yesterday. I talked about it with Ben and Woods. They brought it up as well. But, you know, you, you really look at the Dodgers on top, the Rockies on bottom. How can you dominate Colorado? Can you take as close to 13 of 13 as possible from Colorado? You got thir- you got 11 left against L.A. How many can you take right. against L.A.? Can you take five games? Can you take six games uh, against the, the Dodgers this year? Because on the margins is where this thing is going to be decided. Right, and I think that it's so cliche, but the Potters need to worry about themselves. They've got to not look too much at the division. They've got to not look too much at – what the Dodgers are doing or what the Diamondbacks are doing. Like they've got to play good baseball and stay within themselves and make sure that they are coming together as a team and doing the right things on and off the field that are going to make them successful because it really is going to be winning on the margins. Like, like we're talking about, and you just said, like if every team becomes what they are on paper or is at least close to it, you're going to have to find those edges all season long where you're going to be able to get ahead, where you're going to be able to kind of, you know, separate yourself from the competition. And that might not necessarily be that game, but it could be collectively over the course of a season. So they've got to stay within themselves, not get too up and too down and just continue to play their style. I'm really excited to see two second year performances. And what I mean by that is for Xander Bogarts, his second year as a San Diego Padre. It just felt like last year got off to an incredible start, right? Through five, six weeks, he was hitting toward the top of the league. He had OPS over 1,000. He was driving in runs. He was hitting homers. He gets hit on the wrist. It's the wrist that's been his, you know, chronic bugaboo. He winds up in really a three-month period where he was playing toward the bottom of the league instead of the top of the league. And then, obviously, he got out of it. He had a good August-September for San Diego, but all the way through, there was all, there was kind of a question. Well, is it whose team is it? Right? Is it Manny's team? Is it Soto's team? Is it Tati's team? Where does Xander fit in in the leadership matrix? I feel like now all of that is is away and gone. This is a different year. There isn't the question of too many Chiefs in the clubhouse, and I feel like this is a year that we're going to see the real Xander Bogarts. There's room for all of them. They all can take ownership of certain parts of the clubhouse. And there's all there's going to be things that they do well, each of them, that I think if they can kind of go forward with those, like, you know, Manny is good over here in this area. Xander's good over here in this area. Fernando's, you know, even Fernando is a leader in his own right. So I think a lot of it, um, again, goes back to posting, being on the field, making sure that you're playing good baseball, and then, making yourself open in the clubhouse to be part of this team and, you know, compromise a little bit in probably places, certain places, but also be someone who's available to younger guys, be someone who's available to kind of grow the team as a whole. Um, I, I'm looking forward to, to Xander. You know, I'm, I'm curious about the wrist. I'm curious to see how that plays again. And now in season two, and if he runs into any issues with that, and I'm just curious for to see how he rises. I think he will rise. He, I think year two, he's going to feel a lot more comfortable. Um, he's a great player. He's a great person. I think that he's going to be able to show a lot more of that this season. Said two second year guys. And the second second year I'm referring to is Fernando Tatis Jr.'s second year back from a year lost. A year lost to a shoulder injury. A year lost to a suspension that cut into the beginning of last year. And in the end, Fernando Tatis Jr. had a very good year for the Padres but we know where the level can be and that's we know where the level was do we know where the level can be that's what I'm really excited to find out in 2024 is that 40 homer 40 steel plus elite gold glove defense plus you know all of the electricity that he brings to the park is that still in Fernando Tatis Jr. I believe it is and as such this should be the year for it I'm super excited to see Fernando Tatis Jr. I think that he is on the brink of what could be a huge year, and I don't even want to put that on him. I'm just excited to see him back to being himself. Last year, he was so good with how he handled everything. He did all the right things. He said all the right things, but he also worked his tail off. He just didn't have the offseason that he wanted to have because he was still coming off of surgeries, coming off of the suspension, had to tuck his tail between his legs a little bit, take the lumps, which he did, Gave it back to the fans. I'm super excited to just see him play a little even freer. 
He's got his boy Jerkson on the team. He's got uh, you know a lot of a lot of guys that he enjoys on the team. Um, I think that he's going to get back to just sort of being himself. And not that he wasn't last year, but just again a little bit freer, a little bit more comfortable. It's going to be exciting. Those are some of the things that we're most excited about for the Padres coming into the beginning of this journey in 2024. And, and you know, as you said, Annie, it's not opening day. It's the home opener. That's true. But today the journey begins. Today we, we get started for real. Yeah, we got up at 3 in the morning twice. It was fun. It was unique. It was a little bit different. You know, I, I enjoyed it for what it was. But that was a complete outlier. It, it was truncate your spring training, spill out of Arizona in the middle of March, go across the world, literally across the world, show up, a couple of exhibitions, a couple of games. I uh, kind of wish those were exhibition games in, in hindsight, just based on everything I've heard from folks who have been there in terms of the atmosphere and whatnot. Nonetheless, the games counted, and the, you know, the Dodgers and Padres split two, but now we have this weird interregnum. That's not how baseball goes. Baseball is day to day to day. And today we begin. Today we roll. We don't stop until a couple of weeks from now, right? Yeah, it's going to be so fun. Great teams to start off the season. Really competitive teams. Yes, it's it's going to be hard, but I actually I think it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Like you're going to learn a lot about all of these teams in this first 60 days of baseball, and they're all going to also probably get better. I mean, everybody's still going to be finding their way a little bit this homestand. I don't think you can. Well, we will read too much into it, but I don't. I think you should, you know, not assume that whatever happens this week is what's going to happen for the rest of the season. All the teams are going to sort of be finding their way over this next week or two. It's the same way that it is in football. It always takes a few games to kind of get there. But I'm excited for it. I'm excited for the the Giants and then the Cardinals and just to kind of see what this team has. Yeah, it takes not just a few. Yeah. It takes an inordinate number it of does. games. It does. <laughs> like, it's hard not to – obviously, we, you know, we'll be up and, and talking about every single game. But just like any job, anyone in any job, it takes a little minute to get your feet under you and, and – feel your way and for some of these new guys who they're playing next to learning the fields you know there'll be some growing pains for sure but i think that it's going to be for all the teams all across the board you know it, it always bears repeating annie's heard me say it so many times but every individual game in major league baseball that's just a snapshot of a moment that's what happened that day baseball reveals itself over time and it reveals itself over a long time and quite often, the first message that you get in baseball is wrong. You know, how many teams start the year 22 and 7 and fade out of sight? How many teams start the year 14 and 18 and wind up at the top of their division when things are said and done? Baseball is stupid and no, sh no one should watch is the fun statement I have to encapsulate all of this. Any individual game, if you look at it and you go, oh, my God, that was the thing. You're always wrong. Like you're almost, almost, almost always wrong. That was just a game. Something happened. Ball hit a rock. Guy's slider was nasty that day. Someone showed up with a cold and, and just wasn't feeling it. And he was the person who batted with the bases loaded that day. Like any individual game, we should enjoy it for what it is. It's ba <laughs> as Buddy Black said, hey, that's baseball. Yeah. That's baseball every day. I love that phrase. We, we, <laughs> Bud Black, I, bless him. Yes, that's baseball. And it applies to anything that happens in the game. And he's right. The weird, weird things happen in this game. And you can never really call it. And for as great as some of these teams look on paper, there's going to be some duds. We see it every year. And there's going to be some teams that look like they haven't got no shot that end up going into the playoffs and maybe even deep into the playoffs. So um, that's the fun of it, right? Like, you don't know where your team is going to land. Like, you don't really know how it's going to work out. And you're just along for the ride the whole season. That's it. We we are San Diegans. We know how the title system works. You're you're on the wave. You know, it's about being on the wave and sometimes you get caught in the undertow and I get that as well. But you're you're along for the ride and you have to know that the ebbs and the flows, that's all part of it. Any one game, it's, it's not football. It's not football. There isn't a defining game. There are a set of defining games. And Mike Schilt, as we've heard, he's looking for those. He's looking for those identity games as the year goes along that reveals your character and who you are as a club. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I just think that that's part of the fun of this season, like how they bounce back, how they do under Mike Schilt. I think Mike's well positioned to be a good leader of this team. And I, I, I like... Thanks to this crowd here, I'm getting sunglasses, and they see how uh, how 
tough I'm doing out here. Um, wonderful. <laughs> Ooh, that's better, Chris. Thank you. Um, Chris, looking out, brother. <laughs> oh, hey, thank you, thank you mate. I have Appreciate some in my you. bag, so I'll give these back in the break. But yeah, it's it's going to be a lot of fun, and I think that um, Mike Schultz is well positioned to lead this team. And that's again nothing nothing against Bob Melvin. He was too, but Mike's got two years of watching. These cats in the clubhouse, seeing how they've done, and I think that he's got his own, you know, uh, his own want after what happened with the Cardinals, his own desire to show what kind of manager he can be. So I think a lot of those things are lining up for the Padres in a positive way. Well, today's appearance live at Baja Ricks is brought to you by Blue Moon, and for a moment, so are Annie's eyes. <laughs> Thank you for the free shades. All right, we're going to take a timeout. When we come back, a very interesting, uh, extremely long and detailed piece by Kevin Acey, kind of his season kickoff uh, today in the UT, and it had one central theme. But for A.J. Preller, this is it, man. This is it. You better win, the, better win this year, or else it might be the last year. Let's talk about it. When we come back, Annie and Elston, we are live from Baja Ricks. Come on by, say hello. In fact, at the top of this hour, at the end of our first hour, we're going to be giving away a pair of tickets to the folks live here in attendance to go see tomorrow's game, Tony Gwynn opening day, which includes a Manny Machado uh, opening series hat. Pardon me. It's the opening series hat giveaway uh, is tomorrow. So we will be doing that. So you still have time to get down here, get your name in the hopper. We'll be pulling a name at the top of the hour, giving away Padres tickets, have tickets for the Padres and Cardinals that we'll give away in the second hour as well for April 2nd for next Tuesday's game, the 97-3, the fan poncho giveaway night. We've got a Manny Machado bobblehead to give away. So come on down. We got prizes for the lurkers that are hanging out with us here today. We thank all of you for your time. Take a quick time out, talk some AJ when we come back. Annie and Elston on the fan.
Babu. There we are. We are live at Baja Ricks. Thanks to everybody who's hanging out. I see uh, all the hardworking folks slinging nachos, slinging dogs. Uh, we were given just an incredible plate of carne asada nachos here at Baja Ricks. Great deals going on. Margaritas flowing, beers are flowing, Blue Moon Topo Chico specials uh, here as well today. So, is that the proper term? Slinging, yeah, you're slinging. Slinging nachos, slanging dogs. Mate, you can even do it with the A, slanging. Slanging, slanging nachos. Slanging nachos. That's the proper term for that. Yeah, it's a technical like, term. Like it's a, a murder industry of pros. Term. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a slang of not. We slang the nachos. You know what a group of pugs is called, Braden? We talked about this, and yeah. I forgot. It's you a, were super excited about it. It's though. a grumble. A grumble of pugs. A grumble of pugs. Oh. Like you see, a, if you see a bunch of pugs going down the street, that's a grumble. I never knew that. Yeah. Well, wow. hopefully, one of these teams that uh, we do play by play for can change their name to the pugs, and then. Oh, uh, it's a tackle by a grumble of pugs. Oh, my yeah. God. No, somebody in minor league baseball is doing a grumble pugs uh, alternate jersey this year. I saw, I, saw it, I saw it at some point on Twitter. There's 11 new minor league teams, like team names. One of them I love is the Roman Emperors. And <laughs> the Emperor, and they have an Emperor Penguin as their mascot. Oh, okay. All right. It's on the lid. They also have, I don't know, some Great Lake. I, great Lakes changed their team name, too. I don't know what the team name's called. But their mascot is a pontoon boat that's pissed off. Just an angry. Off, an angry pontoon boat. <laughs> and some of these, some of the gear is hilarious. If I can find it, I'll, I'll put it on the uh, stream. But these are the type of things I need to. I need own, to buy wear a on Roman the Empire, yeah. Roman Roman Emperor's baseball hat. I got to rock that on the show. We need all of these things. This is such a crazy sports day, too. And we'll talk more Aztecs maybe in the second hour. But it's just bizarre because right now we are Padres. We are ready to go. We are so fired up. Opening day, 110 first pitch. Let's go, Padres. Beat them, Giants. And then the game's going to end, and it's going to be like 90-degree turn. Let's go, Aztecs. There it is. Right. Padre hat off. Aztec hat on. They came prepared. Brown and gold hat gear. off. Red and black on. And let's go. Let's take down number one. Let's see if the Aztecs can make some magic. There's no doubt of the two, which is the more important game today. I mean, I mean, it, obviously, it's San Diego State. This is one of 162. Right. But it's just so much fun that we've got this, like, we're going to go hard one direction, and then last out's going to happen, and we're going to just turn, and we're going to go hard the other direction. Yeah, absolutely. And what a great day in San Diego. I love this. They, this couple over here, here at Baja Ricks, had their Padres hats. They have their Aztecs hats. They're just going to switch them off. The Padres are going to show the game here at Petco Park for anyone that's still inside the stadium. So it's just a great day to celebrate sports in San Diego. It really is. And, and I had said something I want to just repeat today because I had it wrong yesterday. It's for ticketed people, so got to have Correct. a ticket. Today, can't just wander in to Gallagher Square at six o'clock, which is, you know, what I consider doing. <laughs> Where I just down here and I heard all the hubbub. It's like the Super Bowl that sneaks into the Super Bowl every year. Yeah. Right? Just do, the, do it for the Aztec watch party. Dion I saw Rich. It, when I was getting my uh, copy this morning, I saw a dude wearing a Giants hat and I immediately went, It's a bad day to be you, buddy. And they came and got my dinner. Some old guy. You got to start, <laughs> you got to start the smack talk early, Craig. One and one. Wait, we're. We're tied for first or tied for last, every way you want to view it right now. That's right. Hey, at least we've got our feet in the sand. All these other teams haven't even jumped in yet. That's you know? right. Yeah. We already got it, Dub. That's it. We've already got our battle scars. That's right. Giants, you guys are soft. Charmin's got nothing on That's you. That's right. Fernando Tatis Jr.'s uh, batting average is higher than we thought, too, by the way. Good point. It's now hitting 375. Yeah, right, because one of Max Muncy's troglodyte plays at third base was changed from an error to a, a hit that was off of his shoddy glove. So the Dodgers saving one of their own guys' fielding percentages increases our guys' batting average. Sounds good. And I hope it just doesn't make you too uncomfortable that I say terrible things about Max Muncy every time I bring him up. He's a Baylor guy. That's fine I think with me. it just went in one ear and out the other. That's fair. I'm looking at all these wonderful people here. I, I, I any, and, any and all <laughs> Baylor hates is well welcomed on this show. Especially from you. And Texas yeah. Tech. You can add to SMU. It's fine. These guys. I yeah. won't even mention their name. But, yeah, yeah same. Anytime you cross a bridge, if you see just a hairy little thing underneath asking you questions, riddles, it's Max Muncy. Max Muncy. It's just hanging out can't down trust there. The, can't trust the Baylor guy, man. Bridge troll. Right. Makes it easier to not like him. Well, for the San Diego Padres, this is another season of consequence. Uh, I, I think last year was one of the most consequential years in the club's history. I think the fallout 
from 2023 to 2024 is pretty obvious. You know, the payroll has gone from third to 15th in the league. We're now a middle of the pack payroll team where we were an elite payroll team last year. A lot of changes. There was a lot of anticipation for a club that only made it to 82 last year. And as such, Annie, uh, Kevin AC today pretty explicitly put it out there in, in a long, you know, reported piece in the Union Tribune. Uh, not a ton of new reporting, just more of kind of an analytical target painted on the GM of the San Diego Padres. That it's been 10 years. There's been a lot of good, a lot of bad. We've talked about a lot of good, a lot of bad along the way, but. It looks like it's maybe playoffs or bust for for AJ Preller this year. And it's fair. Eric Katsenda in spring training also said he's going to be accountable. It's more than we have heard in terms of a a boss about AJ Preller um, in all of his tenure. Really, Eric Katsenda is really the first person to come out on, on on record and say he's just as accountable as everyone else. Now he might have been behind the scenes, but the front facing rhetoric around AJ Preller was always. He is here to stay. We are building something here. And I don't think that that's changed in the sense that they believe in A.J. Preller. I think everybody wants A.J. Preller to succeed in that, inside that building. But there does come a time when you have to look around and say, maybe it's not the right fit. Maybe it's just not working. This is 10 years. You can go ahead and take out the first five years and say, all right, they were building something. They were retooling. They were um, rebuilding their organization, which absolutely, you, you know, for sure. But the last five years, I think that you can look at a little bit more introspectively. You can really try to take apart. He's had some hits. He's had some misses. um, And he's had some issues working with people. But he's also had plenty of people that have said, we love the guy. We love how he works. He's fully into baseball. So there's a lot that can be said here. I don't think that any of it is right or wrong necessarily. Like A.J. Preller does it his way. Is that way the right way for the Padres? Is that way the right way for everyone else in the building? We're going to find out. But I love the fact that he sticks to his own way of doing things. And I do think A.J. Preller has learned from some of the things in the past. And I thought that that article also pointed out, like, every other GM in the league that has had as long of a, t- a tenure with A.J. Preller has succeeded more. They've had Now, they right. have maybe not had the challenges that the Padres have had. I think, you know, you can go back and look at that team by team. But they've had a different bit of a result. Um, but every every position is unique. And I also thought A.J. Preller t- telling Kevin A.C. that he he used to think about building from within the hometown team, but he doesn't. He doesn't. That's not his way. He looks at the great scouting job that they do, the great scouts that he believes he has in his system, and he looks realistically at that farm and he goes, they're not all going to make it. And my way is going to be using some of them, but going with more veteran players. I'd rather have Joe Musgrove and you Darvish on the mound, if possible, versus anyone I have in the farm system right now. And I respect that. I respect the fact that he's on record saying that, that that's the way he wants to go. So he's going to live or die with it this year, but he's he is on notice. Yes, that's for sure. It's been plenty of time, right? But I do agree with what Annie said you know, earlier about the unique situation, as much as we do want to say, like you, you usually get like three or four years and then you're gone if you don't win. Right. I do think the Padres, when this ownership took over and when AJ Preller took over was in such a hole that it was going to take probably five or six years just to get up to a point where then you could rebuild. Right. Almost like you have to rebuild to get to a rebuild. And there's a lot of programs like that. There's a lot of franchises like that. So, you know, as much as we say, oh, he's been here for 10 years, where's the World Series appearance? Where's the where's the division championships? I, I don't want to throw out those first couple of years, but as Andy was saying, it's a different situation for different programs. Like if somebody came in to replace Andrew Friedman forever for whatever reason, he's not going to get four or five years to, right. to turn the Dodgers right. around, right? They already have a built foundation. They got enough spending, all that sort of stuff. But if you got to take over the Padres when they took over the Padres, or you go take over like, you know, a team like Kansas City right now, or the Rockies, like how long do you think it would take to turn the Rockies around? It would probably take at least five years just to get to your rebuilding process. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's Angels. no question about it. Right. There's there's a lot of teams in that mix. The one the one thing I would say in response to that, just kind of adding on, like I said, uh, not pushing at, is that AJ came in to the job in year one with an inordinate amount of confidence. He believed that he was going to build a team that would win immediately 
And then as that team that he built to win immediately started to age out, he would then, after a period of success, transition to a minor league system that we, he would have then built from the ground up starting in 2015. Well, what happened was he built a team to win immediately that was terrible. He built a team that is actually worse than the team that preceded it in 2015. He larded it with old players like Matt Kemp, Justin Upton. And in doing so, he had his first two gigantic swings and misses as a GM, letting Trey Turner and, and Max Reed walk out the door in trades, two guys who are still great players in Major League Baseball. So at the beginning, he didn't have the target set right because they weren't his guys. He didn't have the pure pulse on the system and he made some giant mistakes then the rebuild i think we were all behind it right after the big mistakes and it was like well do you even get to keep your job after year one dude like once they decided to hang on to him the rebuild worked like they got to a good place the quote-unquote waves of talent you add hosmer you add machado then the team went for it in 2020 and again it didn't work out they got a couple of guys in nola and clevenger that helped a little but didn't help compared to what they gave up long term that cost them the depth that was a big in, impact in what happened from 2022 to 2023 right after you cannibalized the system to bring in Juan Soto so it's been these waves of like big try didn't work build it slowly really smart big try didn't work now he's built it again smartly but it feels Annie like this year unlike the previous four years AJ isn't working with 100% free reign. The, the payroll is an issue. And I really keep thinking, like, if my life was on the line as a, as a GM, would I entrust Tyler Wade to help get me across that finish line? Well, he has to work within a budget, but most GMs do. Most GMs across the league have to work within a budget. It's really a unique situation that the last few years they were able to run up the money as, as high as they were. I don't think that that's a common situation that happens for most teams. And, and credit to the Potters for being able to do that, of course. I mean, they, they're, they're having to um, reverse things a little bit this year, right? But they were able to get some players because of it and able to build, I think, like an identity of a team that's here to compete. And I think that's what's so different. Like what A.J. Preller has done, and I, I think that the article pointed it out um, too, is he's made – this team where other players look at San Diego now and go, oh, I could see myself here. This is a team that wants to compete and is trying to compete. He's gotten butts and seats in terms of having a full stadium. He's gotten excitement around. But there does come a point, I, I think, where it's like, is it the, it, are you veering toward that Angels territory where you, you know, you, you, it's cool to have excitement and maybe that is, look, the ticket sales for the, for the Padres this year are, are through the roof. Maybe right. that is what fans want. Maybe they just want the exciting players. And I know that this organization absolutely wants to win. So does AJ Preller, but it's going to be kind of a turning point here. I think if the team doesn't win to, to decide what do you want? Do you just want kind of these big name players? And if you win, you win, but you're going to have kind of these exciting, you know, team names on the back that people are going to want to come see, or do you, do you kind of retool in some different way? Yeah. And you know, one thing that I do think was maybe a, if it wasn't a piece of new reporting, it was something that we had kind of heard or believed, but was said explicitly by Ace in, in the piece today, which is that quite possibly Peter Seidler's last act as control owner was to save A.J. Preller's job last year, that quite possibly Gruppner and Katsenda were heading toward the other exit and, and getting away from an A.J. Preller administration. And Seidler said, no, keep it together. Let's go, which creates that tension dynamic for this year and what ac put in writing is that peter was a part of those xander and manu deals and i think that that also gives a aj Preller some more leash hour number one done just like that your pre pre-game show before we get to the eco water socal pre-game show with sammy levitt inside the ballpark we're live at baja ritz giving away a pair of padres tickets and jefferson jay's got an opening day song for us we're going to hear that next on annie and elston
We are counting down the time, and we have already ripped an hour off. We've got an hour left to go, and then it is pregame show. And then it is first pitch. It's you, Darvish, toeing the rubber. It's the Padres running out in pinstripes. It's Fernando Tatis Jr. elating to the crowd in right field, getting everybody fired up. The vibes are immaculate. We are inside. Well, we are actually on the patio. We are on the patio at Baja Ricks. We are uh, right across the street from the Omni, across from the convention center, right by the trolley. Come on by. Say hello. We are still putting names in the hopper. Uh, Brandon, not to be confused with Braden, correct. just won a <laughs> pair of tickets to tomorrow, to Tony Gwynn opening day, my favorite day of the baseball season. Uh, that's also a day where there is an opening series hat giveaway that is correct we're giving one of those away as well so in our next break we're going to give away an opening series hat the break after that we're giving away a manny machado bobblehead and we're going to wrap out the show giving away a pair of tickets to tuesday's game against the padres and the cardinals on 97.3 the fan poncho giveaway night that's all for the folks in attendance right here at baja ricks must be present to win so happy use day too by the way Come on down. Use pitching. It's always use day. Use day. Happy use day. I know some Ranger fans that love you, Darvish, so much that they watch every single San Diego Padres use day. Yeah. At their local watering hole. They they change the channel over to use day. I know one of them. Shout out Rebecca out there. I know that you're out there. Love use day. Use day is today. So we got one more hour of the show today. We've been talking nothing but Padres baseball. I haven't mentioned the starting lineup yet. No surprise. Yeah. No surprise. Same lineup, right? Brady? It's, same lineup. Yeah, it's the uh, relatively the same lineup. I think it is the exact same lineup, but continuing with the uh, Xander Bogarts in the uh, leadoff spot. Here, I'm pulling it up right now. San Diego. San Diego, Xander Bogarts in the leadoff spot. And batting second is Fernando Tatis Jr. playing right field. Batting third at first base, Jake Cronenworth. Manny Machado, the DH, bats cleanup. Asan Kim bats five. He plays short. Jerickson Profar bats six. He's in left. Camposano in the seventh spot. He's behind the dish. Tyler Wade will play third and bat eighth. And Ryan Merrill, or not Ryan Merrill. I know Ryan Merrill from school. Jackson Merrill will play <laughs> center field and bat ninth. Ryan got excited for a minute. Yeah, hey, you're, like, wait. Ryan, you're getting the nod. He was a, he was a PO, though, so not, not like Jackson Merrill. I love Jackson Merrill in the ninth spot. I really do. Cronenworth yeah. in three. We're going to keep. We're going to keep seeing what he's got. Yep. yep. I agree that you're saying Ben and Woods. When when ben, when when they asked the question of who needs to have a big day, I immediately was saying Jake Cronenworth needs to have a big year. Yeah. Why not start on opening day? Why not get it roll? Keep it rolling because this is one of the players I think Andy that changes the entire tenor of the team if he has a good year, and. and We've seen good years from Jake Cronenworth in the past, but they're a couple years removed in terms of really that offensive contribution that gets you to an all-star game. In 2022, he made it, but he, he didn't have the same offense. Of course, he came through in the playoffs. Last year, the position change, a third straight dip really across the board in terms of his offensive numbers. This is the year that Jake Cronenworth needs to get his career back on track. Yeah, hitting third, a big spot in the lineup. Machado right behind him, Tatis in front of him. I really hope for great things for Jake Cronenworth. He he works his tail off. The guy wants it so bad. It has not worked out, it, obviously, last year. Um, but we have seen what he's been able to do, and I really believe if he gets back to the way he knows how to hit and he's able to just hit to the gaps like he did back in 2020, 2022, um, I think we're going to see a different Jake Cronenworth, a more comfortable Jake Cronenworth, and he's going to kind of – be able to hit those bombs every once in a while. We love that, right? We see go to the crone zone and all of that. But I think last year just was a, a little bit of an off year, and, and maybe he's tapped back into the hitting that he's been so good at in the past. Another very interesting part of this lineup is the decision which Mike Schilt made early in spring training, and he stuck to it, which was to have Hassan Kim in the five hole for this club. He is an untraditional number five hitter. He doesn't have the, the type of power that you would associate generally with the number five spot in the lineup. However, I think the point that the Padres have been making all the way through is that they're not trying to be the bomb your way to success team that LA is. They are a team that needs base hits out of the middle of the order. Well, the other thing you could do with it is basically it's like stacking two orders of four, 
Right. So he's like another leadoff guy. And then you could go, you know, Profar's your two, Camposano is your three, and then you know, Wade would be your cleanup <laughs> guy. Unfortunately, but at the same cleanup. time, but if you do the second like the tiered orders, because some teams do that, you usually usually put like your worst hitter out of the group in eight, and then you put put another yep. guy like Merrill at nine to get back on top, and then all of a sudden Merrill is on base, and then Bogart's like a two hitter is right. up next, and then Fernando's the three. So that, that's why I don't mind the Hassan Kim in the five spot because it's not necessarily just because he's in the five spot doesn't mean he needs to be the big bopper in the lineup too or one of the big boppers. He could be another restart the inning and get a guy on base to start the inning off. Yeah, and he's another one I think that we're looking at this year to see what kind of year he has. Obviously so big for the Padres last year. Heck of an offseason for him. He's gotten better every year Hassan Kim has that he's been in the league. And so I know he worked on some things this offseason. He wants to take those power numbers a little higher. But regardless of the, if those go higher or not, just that he's able to cons- maintain what he did last year or even improve it, it's going to be a big boost for this team. And, of course, you know, as you said, with the free agency looming, there, there's just this question mark that you wonder about all season long because if he has another great year, then ha Sung Kim becomes a coveted free agent. There is a team just up the road that's got a great club, but they don't have really a shortstop. They're playing their right fielder at shortstop now. So it's the type of thing that scares the heck out of you. If, if you think about it in those terms, like it's one thing, like, do we need to really commit to the next five years of Hassan Kim? Like, yeah, but what if he's playing against you? That's the truth. Uh, that's what I think is kind of fascinating about this Hassan Kim situation, because if he doesn't have the year that he had last year, the time to have moved him was probably this past off season. Right. But how do you move a Hassan Kim? Right. I mean, the guy is, so big for your team. He's a fan favorite. Um, but that'll kind of be, I think that'll be analyzed by a lot of people depending on the year that he has. And ha- hindsight's always 2020. Like the Padres are going to make their best decision with their best information at hand. And what a treat it is that he's not moved, that he's on this team this year, that we get to watch him again. But um, going to be interesting for him too, yeah, in terms of how he does and whether that was his ceiling last year or really just the tip of the iceberg. For Hassan Kim. Just playing off that, one of the interesting storylines, I think, especially for the month of April, is Padres infield defense. Because I think the, the metrics show, scouts' eyes concur with this, Annie, that the Padres should be terrific on the infield defense this year, that Xander Bogarts should be able to move from shortstop to second base in a manner that's essentially seamless. The, the things that were the biggest issues for Xander defensively were arm strength and range to his right. Both of those things are countered by getting him off the left side of the infield, putting him on the right side of the infield. That puts Ha Sung back at his natural position of shortstop. But as you like to tell me all the time, that's algorithmy things. Like when you talk about how he should move to second, we get to find out how he does move to second. Yeah, I I am of the, the camp that you could have left um, uh, Xander Bogarts at shortstop, I don't think it would have been a huge issue. But this is a team, like we talked about, that needs to get better on the margins. Like, every out is going to matter for the Padres. Every out is going to matter for this division if it plays out the way that we think it is. So they got a little bit better by putting their most elite shortstop in the shortstop position, sliding Xander over to second, where he could have a monster year, to be honest. Like, you've said that a lot. He could have a great year at second base and establish himself as one of the best in the league. And that's going to be something I think that he'll take a lot of pride in if he does. So I think that you're going to have, I think a better transition for them than for example, what we've seen out of the Dodgers and what they've done with Mookie Betts. I don't, I don't worry at all about this, this infield defense. I really don't. And and tying back to Mike Schilt and to stuff we were talking about in hour number one, Annie, Mike has come in and there's been no bones about who's the leader and who's calling the shots for this club. And, this is not a disparagement of Bob Melvin. It, it's simple fact that last year there were elements to decisions that were made that went beyond the purity of asking what's best for the ball club. You know, Xander played short instead of Hassan because they kind of promised it to him in contract negotiations. You'll have shortstop for at least one year. Yeah. Oh, I don't know exactly who made what decisions on that. There's definitely uh, influence from the front office on certain decisions for right. sure. And then this year, there's probably that same influence on certain decisions. So I don't think anything's being made in a vacuum necessarily, but perhaps there is a little bit more freedom in in certain things being discussed and, and come to a resolution. Well, and 
along those lines. Fernando Tatis Jr. would probably prefer to hit first. He's He made that pretty clear during the spring. Xander likes to hit in the middle of the lineup. He, he's made that clear, but there's Xander leading off, and there's Fernando hitting second because this is the lineup that Mike Schilt thinks is going to give the Padres the best chance to win. Yeah, and that's, I think, something that they're going to learn this year or be used to this year is there's going to be some you know personal preferences that maybe aren't always – taken to <laughs> and these guys are going to be able to to move around a little bit better have a little bit more compromise within their lineups and within how they're playing in the system um and look that only works if your players buy into it and if there's pushback like there was last year your your manager is in a tough spot do you lose the clubhouse do you risk losing the clubhouse or do you fight back on certain things and so um, again, I think that that's something that Mike Schilt learned from necessarily. I don't know that he would have done it any other way, but he saw a little bit of what was going on last year. I don't put that on Bob Melvin because he walked into a, a clubhouse that had a lot of guys with a lot of different preferences. And you you kind of are trying to understand like how the clubhouse is going to work. And, and Mike Schilt does have the luxury a little bit of seeing some of that. So he's gone ahead and said, hey, we're going to be a team that is more flexible, that is kind of be maybe a little bit more compromising and that works and it should work until it doesn't. And hopefully for them, it works the whole year. I think those two are going to flip flop a lot this year. You think they're so? One and two. I mean, they do, they're doing it during spring training. Yeah. I, 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 would, bit, yeah. I would imagine they're probably going to do that. And it's just for us, we haven't been able to get into the groove of seeing the lineup because they had two games and then sure. a week off. And then it's like, Oh, look, it's the same lineup as it was in Korea. But this week, I wouldn't be surprised this weekend if Fernando jumps to the one spot and they might move those top couple of guys around. I like them both in the leadoff spot. I think I prefer Tatis just because of his speed. But the reality is it's like Xander's going to get guys on base. And when he hits a ground ball, he's not going to – at least he's not going to have two outs when yeah. he hits a ground ball. Last year we saw it move quite a bit too. I mean, wherever right. we saw Hassan Kim take over that leadoff spot, yep. that worked out really well for them. Um, so I think that, yeah. It's they gonna, got a couple of yeah. leadoff guys, yeah. right? I mean, I'm, I, if you're going into a playoff game and either Cron- – and either – Bogarts, Kim, or Fernando was leading off. That was the only spot. You'd be comfortable with all three of those guys leading off in a, in a big game. 100%. And Schilt has also said that against left-handers, you might see Ha-Sung back into the leadoff spot right, right. again. So, I mean, that could come as soon as Saturday when Harrison pitches, or unless he pitches yeah. tomorrow. So, I mean, that could happen yeah. right away. Uh, I'm going to just go out there on a tiny limb. It's not that not that thin a limb and say that at some point, Ha-Sung is just going to be the leadoff guy. I Again, think, for this I think team, you could be right. I think that that could happen. I think once for once Fernando starts getting into a, a groove, and you know, we talk about that all the time with this team is everybody wants to see Fernando hit with guys on base, right? Because yes. he's got the pop and he's got the great stick. But you know, I, I I like him in that leadoff spot too. But if he if he can continually bat well in the two or the three spot, then you can move Kim to the front. You know, maybe you put Xander in two or or four or whatever. I don't really like Xander as a four hitter, but. You know, in my opinion, that I mean the Padres should be going with for in some type of order in the top four. The top four guys need to be Xander and Fernando and Manny and probably Kim. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious to see how long that they put Cronenworth in the three. Maybe they yeah. leave Cronenworth in the three spot to just get confidence and and built up with two guys surrounding him that are going to give him a lot of pitches to see. Yeah. And then so. once he gets into a groove, they're like, all right, well we're going to move you back down into a to a spot that kind of fits our lineup a little bit better. Yeah. Plus they clearly don't want to allow a right-handed pitcher to get into a arm right. slot and just get into a groove. A guy like Logan right. Webb today is a perfect example of that. When he can start spotting his sinker on the outside corner to a right-hander and just dot it, dot it, dot it. He is inviting you to roll over ground balls on the left side of the infield. He's inviting you to do it over and over again. When at least you bring that left-hander up to the plate now that spot is down and in it's in the the hitter's sweet spot now he's got to get over to the arm side edge of the plate you're, you're at least switching things up you don't want let, to let someone get into such a routine that he can just snap the same pitch to the same spot yeah, get that lefty in there be able to to you know get, get shake it up a little bit yeah i agree i, I look if, if jake is rolling it just deepens i mean gives you a deeper lineup right like gives you that like you you're not going to be able to have a pitcher that's going to be able to just mow through these guys, or, or actually, I should say, not mow through them, but wait for that next lull right. in the lineup, right? Like, like they did last year. Right. If you can get to that five spot and still pretty much be rolling, like, and then maybe have another uh, bench guy that is a little bit more... Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Playoff team doesn't have Jake Cronenworth batting third. I'm sorry. Like, they don't. Like, there's not a single playoff team that's like, we're throwing Jake Cronenworth out there in the number three spot. 
on a playoff team, he's like as high as six, a six, seven or eight guy. Because you look at these playoff rosters after the trade deadline, right? They're yeah. lo- they're all loaded, right? Because everybody gears up. And if you think about these playoff teams that you've seen in the past, where's Jake Cronenworth hitting on a good playoff team? Right. Seven, and that's not a knock on Jake. That's no. just how good these playoff lineups are. So, you know, if you have him batting third in a playoff game, you're in trouble. And, and that's not a Jake knock. That's just the reality of the situation. But when he's at seven or eight and you got a guy like in like in Jake Croner's batting seven or eight, that, that's a that's a way different story of a lineup, like Annie was saying. I think this goes back to to what we were talking about with AJ Preller, which is yeah. you gave these guys these contracts, mm-hmm. you gave them the big money, you said that these are your core of your team, and now you gotta see how does that ride out. That's who you're working with. And I think that's where you're gonna kind of see some of that the rubber meet the road, so to speak. Yeah. I mean I totally get exactly what you're saying there, Braden. And it's up to Jake to right be the type of hitter that you don't say that about him and you exactly. say he's he's fine and right you there. and you look at him and you say hey this guy's part of our playoff push like this is you know what i mean and i get it i totally understand where you're coming from but right that is on we gave these guys these contracts and now we got to see have them rise to the occasion yeah because you don't really want to pay uh, 12 million dollars for a dude about seven or eight you could be paying him like seven hundred thousand dollars <laughs> and also playing first base right it. yeah that's yeah. also another knock to him but that's not his fault i mean they put him at right. first right, right. You and, know, I, this, and i think the confidence thing is a big thing in, oh, in yeah. terms of being sandwiched in, in that, between those that's, hitters. that's a major thing yeah. with hitting in general at, at any level is just him being confident i mean it, and if he can go up there and be confident and know that he's going to you know, see good pitches and hit good pitches and just focus on the little things at, in his at bats. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter where he's going to hit. He's going to feel comfortable and he's going to be in a spot where he can have success. But right now, they need him to, they, it's not like a pressure thing, but they need him to have a great year in reality, just based on contracts. Yeah. And you got to get that guy right. He can't be all year in, a, in like in his own head right. freaking out. I got to live up to my contract. I got to get home, home, hit home, more home runs. Right. Cause I'm a first baseman, you know? And I thought that was a lot of the case of last year with Jake, right? I agree. He got away from his inside out, you know, shots to left center yep. field and going oppo and playing that game that you would see out of a middle infielder because he got the $12 million a year contract and he's playing first base. And regardless of, you know, them telling him, hey, look, we don't need you to help him runs. We got Fernando. We got Manny. We got Xander. There's something to be said about psychologically. It's like, I'm supposed to be the big power lefty, even though he's not. And he's. I, I thought he was trying to do way too much. If he could just focus on himself and just do his thing, regardless if he's playing yeah. first base or not, I'll take that from yeah. a guy like Jake. Because guess what? Your right fielder's probably going to hit 30 home runs. And right. you love what he said in the offseason about him, too, because I think he kind of realized that, right? right. Like, And he said, oh, I, I got a little vulnerable. I had to open myself up to right. maybe there was a different way. And I, and I do think there's something to be said now. It's like, all right, Jake, he's not getting any more contracts. This is it. Right. Like, just in general. Like, yeah. just with his career, with his age, where it's going to be. He got his money. He's not going to get a raise. He's not going to get any of that stuff. Just go play. That's it. Just go play. Yeah. Like you don't need the long ball anymore to get your big deal. Like you know, if he if he was still getting like league minimum, and he was trying to hit home runs, I would understand that because the guy wants to, that. That's how you get a big contract in Major League Baseball. But now he's got his big contract, so now he's just be able to relax and go out there and play Jake Cronenworth baseball at this point. Yeah, individual pressure, collective disappointment. Those were things that were themes in 2023. It feels like. There's a lot of guys who needed a lesson in their various stages of their career last year. For Jake, that lesson being, I got to be myself. I can't yeah. be someone who I'm not. You know, uh, for all of the superstars on this team, it was that we can't just rely on the back of the baseball card. We have to work together. We have to communicate. We have to be as one as a team in order to find that success. Hopefully, the lessons of 2023 are absorbed and, and and put inside and now you see all of the proper change in what we get from the Padres. Because we've heard all the right things. Yes. We've heard all the right things this offseason. They were embarrassed. They learned from it. They don't want to have that kind of year, but now it's going to be on them to when they get punched in the face it's not to tell be able me time. to show that it's different. It's show me time. Yeah. And especially with this group of guys, if they are the competitors that we think they are, last year probably set them off to a whole nother level. And and I, it's, there's no way they're going to want to go through another embarrassing season like last year. There's too many guys that are competitive in that clubhouse that won't tolerate last season again. 
Ah, you guys got me excited once again. It is 11-20 at 1-10. Yu Darvish throws the first pitch of the domestic season to Jung-Hoo Lee. When we come back during the commercial break, we're going to be giving away uh, an opening series hat to somebody right. here uh, in attendance. And when we come back, local raconteur and cantando. It is Jefferson J. He has got his opening day song. We will bring it to you on the home of Padres baseball. It's Annie and Elston. San Diego's number one sports station, 97 through the fan.
Yes. Annie and Elston back with you. This is 1126 on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. We are live at Baja Ricks. We are out on the patio, and we are getting ever closer to Sam Levitt's Eco Water SoCal Padres pregame show, 1210. Sammy is inside the Western Metals building. He's up in the loft. He's getting ready. He's got his notes. He's got everything set to go. But we've got still another half hour plus with you here at Baja Ricks, Annie Halbern, Craig Elston. And I am really excited, Annie, to welcome to the show a friend uh, for years in the local musical scene. He is a free spirit. He is an entrepreneur. He's a raconteur. Cantando. He is Jefferson J. Hi, Jefferson. Hi, Elston. Hi, Annie. It's a thrill to be here back on the airwaves in America's finest city with its best listeners on its number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Yes. Outstanding. Now, I have heard a number of your great songs over the years. Yes. And uh, you also host Acoustic Evenings. Uh, where, where does that happen, Jefferson? At the historic Athenaeum Music and Arts Library in La Jolla. We're in our 16th season Oh, uh, it's ongoing in the spring and the fall. We had Eagles songwriting legend, San Diego Music Hall of Famer Jack Temption wrote Peaceful Easy Feeling of the Eagles last week. This week, the greatest person I know, Jamie Shadowlight, Irving Flores, and Ashley Norton, the queen of Ramona music tomorrow night at the Athenaeum Music and Arts Library in La Jolla. And the next two weeks, Wax is there on his birthday, April 5th. And I'll be there with Flan, Tim Flannery yes. on April 12th. Amazing stuff in La Jolla. It's an acoustic listening room. It's quiet in there. And Come on out. Come on. 16 years of this. I wrote my master's thesis at San Diego State, and I finished it in 07. It's on the history of the Athenaeum. So that's how one thing led to another. And here we are on opening day at Baja Ricks. Amazing. All right. So amazing. here's what's going to happen. Jefferson has written a song for all us Padres fans yes. for opening day. Mm -hmm. We're on remote. So what's going to happen is Jefferson's mic that he's talking into right now has got to get turned toward the guitar Ooh. or else he wouldn't hear the guitar. So I'm going to take the professional risk, Annie. I I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to take the leap of faith. I'm going to give Jefferson my headset. So Never it's... Mind. If if you ever need to get out the uh, the uh, old hook, the old you know, it's on it's on you, okay. But uh, I'm gonna give Jefferson the headset and let's enjoy a song, Jefferson Jay's original composition known as "Shilt Happens." You know let's there was a it. lot of shilt that got dealt to the Padres in 2023, and this is all about Mike Shilt happening in 2024. We're turning the page right now, and it's awesome. All right, here we go. Sweet. Oh, one more move. Let da, 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 there it is. Okay. There's lots of fine teams that are battling, and some of them will not be pleased. The Dodgers spent a billion dollars. Deep backs went to the World Series. Yeah, we may not have Juan Soto or Snell, Hader, Luga, Waka, Sanchez. But now we're kind of like a different tree with Jackson Merrill branches. And we'll be battling for third place. We're swinging for the fences in a third place way. We'll be fighting for third place. I hate to say this on opening day. We tossed our Melvin. Now we got a shilt. Oh, shilt. Our baseball team is really darn well built. That A.J. Preller makes all the dope trades, and he's pretty cute, too. Got Dylan Cease, now Cease to be amazed. We'll be battling for third place. We're swinging for the fences in a third place way. We'll be fighting for third place. Cause we know the Rockies won't have a say. Maybe we'll wind up in second. Ooh, the silver. If Corbin Carroll gets a different job, maybe you'll find us in first place. If Otani gets clipped by the mob, maybe you'll find us in first place. And we'll win the whole darn thing from kickoff in Korea, not the Kim Jong Un one. We'll take that diamond ring, maybe you'll find us in first place. Yes! And the Padres will take it all. That's the beauty of opening day. 
That's the beauty of old baseball. Play ball! That's right. Thank you. Thank How you. about it? How thank about you. it, everybody? Schilt Jefferson J. Schilt happens. That was extremely funny and thank very you. good. Thank and you. I loved it. I loved it, Jefferson. Thank you. Love you guys. Appreciate Huge you, fan. Brother. Big supporter. Some people on one of those hateful groups is like, I'm not sure about Annie and Elston. I wrote, Oh, I think they're swell. We feel no one you're said swell anything too. back. Yeah, well, they're scared. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much, Jefferson J. I, f- I feel like, uh, you know, this could become a recurring segment over time. Mm, and yes. what, what do you think? Yeah, yes, yeah. always. I guarantee that either your mic is off or I just can't hear you. I, I see. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> there you are. There she yeah. is. It's like I knew I knew that you were speaking and I couldn't hear you. And that's that's an old classic. Yeah, so did, your yeah, review. Did you know that this was happening today? Uh, you know, I think we oh, texted at some point and I completely like, yeah. forgot. So. Then I saw Jefferson. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I think we because Jefferson. I did not know this was now, happening today. Did Jefferson <laughs> helped us. Uh, do you remember when we had on the guy from the long hairs? Uh, the charity yes. out at, uh, at, at, at the pier. I was gone that day. I remember you had a. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the big cut, the great cut 2024. So Jefferson helped us out with that. And then I, I've known him back from Scott and BR. Yeah, back from, back yeah. from the day. I, I love. Like 15 times like that. Yeah. Each one was <laughs> More hilarious than indeed, indeed. Thank you for entertaining the masses today. Love you guys. I'll step aside and let you fire it up. Broken damn it. Tony's hosting open mic in Ocean Beach Tuesday. Love it. Tony's open, 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 mic on, open mic And you'll Tuesdays. be with Flan when? April 12th. April 12th. Okay. okay. Music and Arts Library. I love Flan. He played at that great cut show downtown. Yep. Downtown. Yep. Yep. I'm going to bounce because even though I love to talk all day, I value. I respect Wood, and I respect you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Have Jefferson great J. Opening great day. stuff, Thank Barney. You very much. Great we song. Did. Yeah, I think I think he like texted me like two weeks ago, and I was like, "Oh yeah, maybe come out to Baja Ricks. Here. That'd yeah. be fun." And then yeah, here he is. Slipped your mind. He's a man of his word. Yeah. That's right. He's yeah. I love this guy. Yeah, I love this guy. Yeah. I'd, love to, I'd love to get a new song every month. Yeah. A new song every month. From Jefferson J. That's, that's music to Jefferson J. Every month. I think he could do it every week. I mean, well, yes, but. Don't tempt him with a good time, my like, friend. I think every week. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. That was really, really funny. I hope we got that clipped off. Uh, I'd like to hear it again maybe after Friday's show. <laughs> Frank, got to clip that. <laughs> clip that one out. That was an original. That was a JJ original right there. We're going to come back. One last mega size segment to get us to Sammy Levitt. We're going to be giving away a Manny Machado bobblehead to somebody in the audience here during the break. And we've still got Padres Cardinals tickets to next Tuesday's game, Poncho Giveaway Day, to give away and give out to the folks here as well. So don't go anywhere unless you're on the way here, in which case, keep coming. Show up here, Baja Rex, Annie and Elston, until 12.05 on the fan.
All right, here we go. Last segment, live from Baja Ricks. We've still got one pair of Padres Cardinals tickets to later in the homestand to give away. But we are wrapping things up on the pre pregame show, wrapping up six hours of live broadcast here at Baja Ricks. Annie, Ben and Woods out here, full showing up even before the sun was up. Before 6 a.m., the excitement for Padres baseball uh, is real. I've got a dude who I see who painted his beard yellow. Shout out to you. Matching the cap. That works. So, uh, it's, you know, it's great to be out out with the people, Annie, out here. Oh, that, oh, that there he is. Yeah, like, look at all these fans. Like, I was looking at somebody for a yellow beard, and I was like, dang, man, that's awesome. <laughs> That's, that's commitment. He's, He's also got, got uh, like, like you know, flavor, flavor, flavor flavor thinks that's a little big. Is it going to work like that tomorrow? Does, tomorrow? Does that come out immediately? Or? Or? Oh, all right. right. It's a big stopwatch on the back. Hopefully he didn't use the permanent paint beard or the beard paint. Curse right. into the weekend. It's more like a Mookie Betts permanent. Permanent for now. That's right. 100%. I like it. But but he didn't he didn't do the mustache, which makes the must, mustache pop. It's awesome. Uh, thanks again to Jefferson Jane for a song. Uh, Annie was just uh, showing me uh, in the chat the, the, you know, you get a range of reviews, Jefferson, as always, you get a range of reviews <laughs> from, from confused to aghast to, uh, to happy. <laughs> and that's, that's completely all right. I like injecting a little weirdness into everyone's life here, uh, getting ready for the game. Now, getting ready for two games, Annie, because... It's Aztecs as soon as this one's done. And we, we've, we've given San Diego State a, a tiny bit of love on the show earlier, but I think they deserve a little bit more. What a day it is. What a run it's been for San Diego State. Back to the Sweet 16, back-to-back -back years in the Sweet 16. There's nothing to be taken away from in terms of their success. But now you get to play UConn. You get to play the defending national champ. The college basketball world has written off this game completely written off this game. You can't find one person that's picking the Aztecs. They're 11 and a half point dog now, which is crazy to me. Yeah, you can tell that UConn is very sure about their ability to be getting past the Aztecs and moving on to the next round and their fans are and people are making flights and it's all it's a whole thing. Everyone is kind of counting the Aztecs out here, but I think Brian Detcher is going to have them ready, a good game plan. This is what March Madness is about. You get to shock the world. You get to come in and show that you are a contender. And it's going to be tough, but I don't think that it's something that they can't handle. We talked about some of the players who have to rise to the occasion today. And uh, I'll just reemphasize what we said yesterday. Jaden Ladee has carried this team like they were in a backpack over his shoulders all the way through to the Sweet 16. He has carried this club this club needs to carry Jaden Ledee today to get to the Elite Eight. They have not faced a team like UConn this year in terms of collective size. Two bigs coming at him. Guys, he's playing center against somebody who is going to have him by five inches off the drop today. So today is the day for Lamont Butler, for Darian Trammell, Reese for those Waters. Reese Waters, Boy, like for Bird, Miles Bird, for the seniors, first off, though, I think about Butler and Tremel, for yeah. those senior guards to step up, to play smart, to not make mistakes, and to hit the shots when the shots are presented to them. Absolutely. And this is what you want. I mean, you're absolutely right. This is a big man's team. And they're going to need to find other ways to score. They're going to do their part on defense. They're going to have all their hands, their work cut out for them with the, the players that are on this UConn team. It's not just one good shooter, although they do have that. 
it, they've got a good stack there. They've got a good roster of shooters. So I think that you're going to have to find a way to get the ball to these other guys, and then they're going to have to make – they're going to have to execute. They're going to have to make those shots. We saw them do it against Yale. It's a much different team than Yale, just for all the reasons you just mentioned. So this is really a step-up shot. It is, and, and of course – the great thing about the Aztecs is that there's things you know about San Diego State. So you know that this team is going to defend UConn absolutely as hard as they possibly yep. can. Uh, a great point that, you know, Mark Ziegler and others have made over the course of the week is that last time it was, you know, a day to prepare for UConn and coming off of the biggest win in the history of the program. And, okay, now we're going to run. And UConn's a tough team. They're a hard team to scout. They're a hard team to have your scout team duplicate. Obviously, they've got the athletes to run whatever, all the sets that they run at the highest level possible, but to have at least a little bit more time for Coach Dutch, for Coach Velasquez, a little bit more time to game plan, a little bit more film to watch this year on this season's UConn team, I'm expecting them to at least be dialed in on what the plan of attack is to slow down the Huskies. Yeah, because right, they, exactly. They faced them, obviously didn't get through them last year, but I do think that they're going to be well set up. Now, are they going to be out executed? Maybe, right? I, that, that could possibly happen. But I think that in terms of preparation, in terms of a game plan, in terms of knowing what is coming at them, they're going to be ready for that. Need to start off. Need to start. Absolutely. Need to take the crowd out of the game. Yeah, the crowd. That's the the thing with the crowd in March Madness, too, is, you know, you're going to have four schools represented during this game, right? right. Because they – this. In order to go to the second game, it's all part of one session. So Illinois and Iowa State are going to be there. And usually the neutral fans don't really have a rooting interest until like later in the game. Yep. And if the underdog is hanging with them and the underdog is trading blows and then the underdog has the lead, the crowd gets more and more into it. They go, maybe they could pull this off. Let's get let's keep it going. And that seems to be the case at every type of March Madness event. So you got to strike early. You really got to punch him in the mouth. You got to limit possessions. Good guard play outside of Ladee. Keep Ladee on the court. No fouls in the first five yeah. minutes, and be able to just hang around. You just got to hang around with that UConn team, and then no one to go on a run. It, it's almost like as much as it cliche would be to do, talk about a rock. It needs to be like a Rocky fight, yeah. right? Just hang around for those first couple of minutes, right? You know, maybe maybe lay a big punch early if they can get out to like an 8-2 run to start the game and show UConn that they're not messing around. Because as soon as, you know, at the beginning of college basketball games, the, the favorite is always like, we're good, we're good, we're good. And then that 10-minute to 5-minute mark in the second half is like, okay, maybe we're not good. And then all of a sudden panic starts to ensue. And when you got guys at UConn thinking they got to start hitting threes and start being the guy, then you can really start to use your momentum against them. And then all of a sudden, the pressure gets flipped to UConn yeah, instead of San Diego it. State. So Aztecs need to win the crowd over quick, get off to a good start, and flip the pressure on a UConn because in every sport, playing with pressure is way more different than yeah. playing when you're calm, cool, and collected. Yeah, and then there's two things that the Aztecs need to do today to beat UConn that they haven't done all year. One is 40 minutes of offense. The Aztecs usually have 25 to 30 minutes mm -hmm. of offense, and they have 10 to 15 minutes of no buckets. And, and they often have a second half, eight minute stretch where they don't score a bucket and they're hoping to get a couple free throws along the way. You just can't upset UConn doing that. So today has to be that day where there isn't that six-minute oops uh, along the way. That's one thing that they have to do they haven't done this year. The other is win in a hostile situation because for the fans, for UConn, I mean, you're right, 100%, Braden, from ticket allocation, they've sent tickets to the four universities. UConn's going to have the majority, but, though. But right? UConn has all the casuals. It's like having to play Arizona in L.A. Like That's Arizona's going to take over that arena for the next two the next two games. North Carolina is the one. Arizona's taking over Staples Center or Correct. whatever the heck it's UConn's called. Right have the home field advantage. Oh yeah, They're absolutely. Have home fan advantage. Yeah, I, sure. I, Iowa State's got a passionate fan base, so does Illinois, but you know how many of them are jumping on a plane to Boston? Right. right? right. That just that just went to the other previous sites that they're at. You know, you got a quick right. drive down down the highway to to uh to TD to TD Garden, then 
Yeah, they're going to take over the the spot. But I'll tell you what, though, San Diego State wins that game. Tickets are going to plummet. <laughs> That's the, the 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 coolest the coolest thing in those NCAA tournaments is is the ticket stock market after games where where you see ticket prices plummet or increase, and everybody's trying to get rid of their tickets of the teams that lose. You try to sneak down into the seats of the of the losing team in the first game of the of the doubleheader, but. It's, I, I think it's going to be a, a fun game. And if, if San Diego, the one thing that we know San Diego State absolutely could not do, they can't give them a, a lead yeah. that they have done so right. many different times right. where they, they take a little bit to warm up. They got to come out guns blazing early if they want to be around. Yeah, they're going to have to play clean basketball, their best basketball of the season, really, yeah. and do it for a longer period of time. But then also, yeah, if they can change UConn's tempo, if they can get them out of rhythm a little bit, just shake them up a little bit, I think that'll help them go, go a long way. Can't wait to see it. And again, all of our attention, all of our mojo, our vibes, they're all headed toward the Padres right until the 27th out. And then, like, the instant what the 27th out is over, it's like, boop, change hats, change gear, let's go Aztecs. What a day today. Like, you do, you think about for San Diego how great this is. Because you've got a team you can really get behind with the Padres. You've got a team you can be proud of. You've got a team that's going to be able to compete and have a chance. And then you've got the Aztecs who are doing their own, holding their own within the league and the country and just giving everyone someone, something to be proud of there. So it's it's a fun day. Let's take it as we've just got the, the closing minutes of the show. Let's talk a little bit about everything happening in the world of Major League Baseball, right? We, we are locked in on what's happening in San Diego, but all of the baseball world, save the couple of rainouts uh, that have been announced, they're getting rolling today. Uh, just open-ended, Annie, what are some of the biggest storylines around baseball that you're excited to see how they play out early in the year? Well, a thousand percent Otani and the Dodgers. Yeah. <laughs> excited to see how that goes. Who's, but, who's Ipe got today? <laughs> Anybody know who's got Where today? Where is Ipe? Where I don't know. He? <laughs> Does he I, like I the Angels plus like, 165 <laughs> or the Orioles today? Where? But I do think, like, take Shohei out of it. It's just the Dodgers. Like, are they going to have on paper – is that going to translate to a winning team that goes deep in the playoffs? Because for the Dodgers, the regular season has never been their issue. But are they going to have a problem like the Padres did last year where it was just like too many pieces coming in from the outside, too many big contracts that maybe weren't the right roster moves to make, you know? Yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious to see that. I'm curious to see this whole NL West. Um, but even teams like the Cardinals, who they're going to face next, like, did they do enough in the offseason? There's just so many storylines for teams that historically have been good to see, like, where is this, you know, where is this season going to land them? And are they going to be able to keep their their legendary ranks of, uh, upon baseball? I can't believe we're the second game of the day, by the way. Yeah, I know, because of the I rain, know the jumps, rain right? Has, right? Yeah. So, like, the first game is in Baltimore. It's the Halos and the Orioles. And then it's us with, like, 15 other – well, not 15, obviously, but, like, four other games – that yeah. are all not on the West Coast. And like, can the Diamondbacks repeat? Can yeah. they do it again this year? Yeah. There's, I mean, this division is going to be fascinating. You've got the soap opera storyline. Melvin leaves San Diego for San Francisco. He brings in two of the guys that, according to Scott Boris, and of course, Scott Boris has every reason to lie, but according to Scott Boris, Chapman and Snell said, I want to play for Bob Melvin. I, I, you know, just find a way. Get me to San Francisco because I want to play for Bob. So did he practice that speech in the mirror before? He met? <laughs> Seriously, right? <laughs> Seriously, he, they went where the money and the necessity was, not necessarily. That's Bob right. Melvin was there, and then they're like, "Yeah, it was for yeah. you. It was for you, it was for you Big you Bob. Long. We both played for Bob. We love Bob." But how does that team come together? Farhan Zaidi is another guy that's on yeah. the hot seat. We talked about AJ in the first hour, Annie. Farhan Zaidi is 100% on the hot seat if his team finishes fourth. And the Giants have also had their weird problems. They've had, there's been stories going into last year even, how they've been trying to like revamp their whole, um, you know, video department and the way that they, I mean, baseball ops, like the way that they do their studying and how they get players doing stuff. And it's completely changed some of the ways that they do things there in San Francisco. So like the Giants have had their own kind of like off the field issues. How is that going to translate? I look to the East. The Braves are the presumptive best team. It's hard. It's hard to look at the Braves and think that they're not going to be at the top of the the baseball kingdom again this year. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, the Phillies and too. The Phillies, I mean, the, the Phillies. Phillies too. That's what I was yeah. going to say. The Phillies uh -huh. look pretty good too, man. They, they. I mean, they've they've been good, but you know, can they get over the hump? That is the Atlanta Braves, which has been a problem for them 
uh, the last couple of years. And it's it's a shame that that game got postponed today. It would have been fun to watch that one yeah. today. Yeah. Well, it absolutely would have. Yeah. But I, I, I do think Philly could have another level. I don't think it's impossible that the Phillies actually challenge the Braves for the top of the NL East this year. And the reason I say that is I feel like the Phillies have a complete team that also has a narrative. They have a storyline. This is a club that went to the World Series last year. They were supposed to go to the World Series. They were were at home needing one win over the Diamondbacks, and they're back-to-back National League pennant winners. And, of course, the Diamondbacks come in and steal their thunder, but they – Double down on Nola, double down on Wheeler. They've made the improvements to the team. They've kept the team together. And I just feel like the Phillies window, it's not forever, but it's now. Yeah. Like right now is, is where their window is. So it's not impossible for Bryce Harper to have a bigger year, for Castellanos to have a bigger year, and for that team to take another step forward. They got a great mix, yeah. right? They got a great they mix do. of young guys. But by the way, those young guys that have now played in the league for a couple of years right. and have some experience now, you know, as, as opposed to just throwing a young guy out there. So they got the good mix of young, controllable players that they're not paying high uh, high-level money to. Mixed with the superstars on the big contracts, they got a good starting rotation. They got an ace. They they really improved their bullpen, and they got a very much a complete team. That's why when we've been talking about where the Padres fit at the end of the season, can they get in the playoff spot? We go, Dodgers are in, Phillies are in, Braves are in, and one team from the Central is in, and everybody else is battling for the the last couple of spots. Yeah, I'm really interested to see how the Cubs play out. Uh, we had Joe Sheehan on the show before Joe Sheehan newsletter. I've been reading; he's been putting out three teams for previews he had the cubs as one of the three best teams in the in baseball this year and i was like what really i'm not buying that yet cubs 95 98 wins for the cubs this year not ready to say that yet. i think they've gotten better they have gotten better but on like in terms of the moves that they made and everything and the steps that they're taking but yeah they got to kind of prove that there's some young pitchers who'd have to be great 95 98 is it's hard in baseball oh man they They need a lot of things to go right just like the padres need need a lot of things to go right yeah i agree with that and and they're two teams the cubs and padres that are going to rely on their pitching and defense Mm -hmm. to get them through this year i think that's important for padres fans to recognize this team if they win if they go where we want them to go they're going to do it by pitching the ball and they're going to do it by catching the ball I think this rotation for the Padres, while there are some question marks, they made it better with Dylan Cease. They've got a good rotation. If everybody is coming back healthy and the way that they are able to pitch, you know, Darvish is at his his best. Joe Musgrove is at his best, which we have no idea. Like, we have no reason to believe that it won't happen, that they won't be, right? I think that this rotation is going to be another really solid rotation for the Padres. They've got some questions on the back end. They've got some questions in the bullpen. Their five is definitely a question, but the top four, Annie, you're right. It's 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 good. It's they went went by adding Cease, they went from a rotation that can make the playoffs to a rotation that can win in the playoffs, and that's Correct. a major difference because we think back to 2022 and what killed the Padres in the playoffs in 2022. It was Mike Clevenger yep. and Sean Mania, yep. and it was their turn in the rotation. They had no plan aside from we got to go with one of these guys. And it, ne- it didn't work out. It didn't work for, out for him in L.A., and it didn't work out for him in Philly, where you needed you needed, one, you needed that one more starter to get you through it. And now with Cease, I mean, that, that guy's Michael King, maybe. Or maybe it is, maybe it is. but the way the, the season goes, it's you, Darvish, or Dylan Cease, or Joe Musgrove. You're cool with any, any four of those guys being that yeah. guy. Boy, I mean, you're just pulling – feels out of the uh, out of the back of my lizard brain right there Braden. in you terms li- of you have a lizard th- that yeah we all do in terms of that bottom of the first inning of game four of the nlcs that might be like 15 of the worst minutes in padres history being up for nothing yeah. i know knocking that dude out of the game and then three batters into the bottom of the first we were all screaming get Clevenger out of there he can't get anyone out and he literally couldn't get anyone out i think too do we need to define what a successful season is for the padres i mean is it the world series no is it no the this is not a world series or bus team it's make the playoffs for sure. playoffs yeah go yeah make the playoffs and be able to so we, make a run for we shut Henny down real quick. <laughs> We're like, no, 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 no. no that no, was no, last no, no, year. No, no, no. That was last year. Yep. Yep. This year they make the playoffs. I would consider. Would you not be 
excited they made the playoffs, right? Make like, would you? Play. you would... And, and here's the thing: if you make the playoffs, it's anyone's game. So Correct. if you make right. the playoffs, it's on you. You make the run. You make the magical run. Or I feel like last year. They, well, they didn't make the playoffs, so obviously you're disappointed. But like if last year, if they made the playoffs and were lost in the wild card round, you'd be disappointed. Yeah. Sure. This yeah. year, if they make the playoffs with their roster and they and they lose in the wild card, you'd be like, hey, you know what? Not a bad season. You had the young guys in there. You get, you know, it's 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 a bounce back from from the year before. Let's pause ten seconds for legal station identification. You're listening to the home of Padres baseball, ninety-seven feet of fan. All right, now we are in the four-minute countdown. Here we go. We have just minutes to go before we hand this off to Sam Levitt inside the loft, the Eco Water SoCal Padres pregame show. This is the last time, guys. We, I know we've given our win total predictions, but this yeah. is the last time he can change it. We are setting it in stone in these next four minutes. All right. I'm, I I'm, had I had my number. I, yeah. I think I'm going to keep it, but. What do you, what do we got here? How many wins? I got, they I got 85 wins. They in the playoffs? The Padres. I got 85 wins and, and it's fighting for that six spot, mate. It's fighting for that six spot. I think it's going to be the line. It's going to be 85 or 86 this year in baseball. And I'm hoping it's 85. Danny. So I can't go with odd numbers. Cause like, you know, when I yeah. turn, when I turn my uh, radio dial, it's gotta be an even number. Like, and uh -huh. volume wise, so you never that. listen to the station. But like, it can't be like, you know, when you turn your volume down, it's, it's like 14, 15, 16. We have it's three odd numbers as number. our, as our thing. Uh, okay, not that, guys. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna raise it up. I'm gonna go 86. Wow, oh. really so you changed it after wow. the yeah, Korea really series. Right yeah, I changed it. You, you, say, you added two more wins, Raiden. you know what? Yeah. And he's like, I'm after that performance, we're winning two more, two more times in LA. I'm just feeling the vibes right now. Well, then I'm the guy that has to pick the lowest number, but I, I had them at 84 <laughs> wins uh, going into it. I'm going to stick with the 84 wins. They're on pace. I thought they'd split in Korea. And I think 84 wins gets them in the playoffs. I did my season predictions. I thought they would be, you know, I went through it all tied for the giant with the giants to that final spot. And they beat them in the head to head during the season. Give me the Padres at the sixth seed with 84 wins on the season. And as Annie said, we've talked about it a lot. You make the dance, man. You can. You got. You got a chance if you yeah. make the dance. And I think. I think they'd be in it. That was nice. Thank you. Six seeds, two for two, winning the pennant. That's so, right. You know what? That's the Padres' problem. They haven't been the six seed yet. Yeah. Don't tempt me with a good time. That's right. that six spot. I want the six. I don't want the five. I don't want the four. It's I'll good. take the six. Take on a central team. That's right. In the first round. Go. Sounds like a plan. I'm all for this plan. I'm, I don't mind it. Live, live remote shows in Wrig at Wrigley Field. I'm looking forward to it. I love it. Either way, what we know is that as a community, as a Friar faithful, we walk into this together with open eyes, with full hearts. We are ready to go back this club today, be in full throat inside Petco Park. What, what are you guys going to do? Are you going to cheer Bob Melvin when he's announced? I'm not booing Bob Melvin. Gonna, there's there's no Bob reason Melvin. to boo. You're going to be in the press box. You can't You can't cheer or boo. I'm not. There's no reason to I boo Bob boo Melvin. I wouldn't boo him either anyways. No. <laughs> Nor would I boo Blake Snell. No. There's no, no reason to. I never boo Blake Snell. <laughs> now, if the Giants kick your ass Blake. for I, four straight games, then you can boo him <laughs> yeah. the next time he's here. But <laughs> right. the first day, no. There's no reason to and boo Bob Melvin. And I will say that players, a lot of times, you know, booing can be a, it's a big sign of respect. That's right. You boo the great ones. That's true. Nobody. You don't boo a nobody. You don't boo the nobodies. That's fact. I would give. I would, I, I will give Bob polite applause. A polite one, like, like your golf just clap, like, just golf like clap, that, yeah. just like that. Thanks for the memories. Thanks for the times. Thank you, Bob. Two years, both winning years. Hey, both winning years. Took the NLCS. Yes. I mean, can't hate the guy. No for that. losing records. Yeah. Thanks to sweeping like the A's and the White Sox. Hey, you know what? But, hey, they won. <laughs> There's a lot of years where the Padres could not do that. May the you, best right. teams win. Right. As long as we're you one don't of need them. to boo them. That's right. <laughs> And he's got her but major. Do whatever you want. I'm not going to tell you that fan. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Fan, Lowe. however you want. And he's yes. got her MLB hat on. I just hope everybody has a good time. Yeah, I just hope, <laughs> I just hope they all get out of there safe. <laughs> Everybody's yeah, good. Yeah, I'm rooting for safe. baseball. Exactly. Have a great time. Be safe. Don't, you know, make sure your neighbors around you, they're That's good. Right. Be kind, people. Annie, enjoy the time inside the press box, down in the clubhouse. Look forward to hearing what you hear tomorrow morning on the show. Hey. Love this, guys. Thanks for everybody being out here. It's awesome. Thank you. Thanks yeah. to Adam. Thanks to our promotions team for doing an amazing job. We're still giving away a pair of Padres tickets on the way out. But up next, it's the EcoWater SoCal Padres pregame show with Sam Levitt. Padres baseball.
next on The Fan. Woo!